of eight acres of plant sites. He's the one with the brain, he's the one with the brawn. Uh, <laughs> going to change things up a little bit, give you two for the price of one. Uh, so that would be a bit exciting uh, for the audience. Uh, I'm the managing director for Concilia in the UK. I moved from uh, Sydney. We've, we've travelled 12,000 miles to get two minutes for every thousand miles we've travelled with you today. So that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, I worked with Matt before being moved to the UK to head up a UK business. Uh, and we worked on some, what we thought were pretty exciting uh, transactional hubs. And after spending, I've been here three or four months, and I thought, you know what, the UK is going through the same transition. Uh, that, that Australia has seen, and I thought it'd be great to draw some parallels for you. And I've invited Matt and, and we have our host Matt here to share with you the journey he's been through. Uh, my notes are to help translate for you, because he's an Aussie. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to translate into UK stats for you, okay? I'm going to translate for you some of the messaging that he gives related to our banking environment, so that it helps you just position the work that he's done and how far he's come. Without further ado, Matt, over to you. Absolutely. And yeah, look, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here, to be able to speak to you about what we're doing in Australia, and certainly a real pleasure to be here uh, with Concilian, who's a very close partner of ours and really integral to the work that I'm going to uh, talk through today. So let's set the stage, set the scene with what the problem is. And I'll talk about this from an Australian perspective, and as, as Louis said, uh, he'll help to translate some of this into the UK uh, scene, but I expect uh, that a lot of what I talk about you'll be pretty familiar with. So firstly, the declining cash, the declining cash usage, which is, is a fundamental problem in Australia. I think it's probably similar in, in the UK. To give you a sense of what's happening in Australia, um, if we use ATM withdrawals and FPOS cash outs as, as a proxy, uh, we're down about 18% on pre-COVID levels and down about 35% from peak, which was in around 2008, 2009. And so obviously when you adjust for CPI, that's a much more significant decline. And as a proportion of total payments, a very significant decline. When cash declines, then that means there's less activity at the branch. And of course, especially in, in the wake of COVID, then there's more foot traffic going through the branch for other things as well. So banks are making rational economic decisions with where they're investing their capital and where they're sending their OPEX. Um, certainly the conversations I have with banks in Australia, they're, they're acutely aware of their social contract <laughs> and the, importance, uh, the important role that they play in the community but fundamentally they have rational decisions to make and that does mean rationalisation of their branch network. What happens next? Well, when a branch closes, especially if it's in a small regional town and a small country community, then there's backlash, there's outcry. Uh, and we do see that in Australia. Um, what we're finding is, you know, usually it might get a local newspaper article or it might be a local politician kicking up a stink in Parliament. We're not getting the same. I believe there's a bit more activity going on in the UK around that backlash, uh, but, but in, in, in Australia, it, it's a bit sub subdued at the moment. Uh, Louis, yeah. what do you experience? So our stats are um, approximately 50% of all bank branches uh, have been closed since 2015. So, um, not too dissimilar. I think Australia's moved very aggressively too. I think the other difference uh, with the uh, compared to the Australian market is here in the UK, uh, very strong regulatory guidelines. Whilst um, uh, uh, the Commission said basically, uh, banks, please regulate yourself uh, or we'll regulate for you. And as a result, there's certainly not that activity in Australia, but there is here. And I think you've seen it in other countries in your travels too. Yeah, right? that's right. Look, certainly that, that's, that's a similar story in New Zealand. Our, uh, just over the ditch from, from Australia, uh, there is yeah, the, the, the Reserve Bank in, in the case of New Zealand is pushing the banks to find a solution to uh, physical banking. In Australia, the closest we've gotten was the previous government established a regional banking task force. Um, sounded good at the time. Change of government meant that that really died a bit of a quiet death, unfortunately. So, so what it means is it's incumbent on industry to find a solution to this problem because there's not the government uh, impetus to do so. Okay, what I want to do now is take on a bit of a journey. We're here in London, so let's uh, start ourselves in London, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, fly across the world a, a bit faster than, than yeah. bit faster than my trip here uh, uh, earlier in the week. Um, okay, so we're now in Agnes Water, which is in central Queensland on the coast. It's a it's a holiday destination about uh, five hours north of uh, Brisbane. Uh, Three thousand population. 
doubles or even triples in holiday periods to give you a sense of the size of the town. Um, I was there earlier in the year on a bit of a research trip um, and uh, I visited some of the local businesses to find out what their banking experience was. So in Agnes Water, there is one very small bank branch and a bank at post outlet. When I was talking to these local businesses, they said that the services were basically inadequate and they didn't serve what they needed. The, 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 the branch was too small to serve their needs and the bank and post outlet kept on running out of the right denominations for them to run their businesses. So what it means is that if you're a business in Agnes Water, you are uh, jumping in your car and driving to Gladstone or to Bundaberg, you can go north or south, about 130 kilometres to do your banking each direction. Let, let me interpret this. This is, this is worse than driving London to Cambridge to do your banking services. So those, those are the poms in the room will know that's a pretty fair old haul uh, and it's further than that, right? Yeah. So I, I, on this trip, I spoke to Les and Mitch who run a regional news agency in, in, a, in a local community. And for a news agency, they, uh, they, they sell lottery tickets and from a regulatory perspective, they've got to, got to deposit their cash takings from lottery <coughs> tickets at least twice a week. So if you think you're a small business running a local news agency and you've got to get in your car and go and do the banking out of town twice a week, think about the impost that that's gonna be on you to run your small business, yeah? Okay, let's uh, take a step back and look at this from a national perspective. So. Uh, the, the, the diagram on the left here is branch activity, branch closures over the last five years, 2017 to 2022. Uh, the red columns obviously are the closures, the yellow are the ones that are still open. You might see a couple of green there as well. There are openings, there's not too many of them. Um, we're down about 30% over that period in terms of branch closures, but the important point is that this is accelerating. So if I look at 2017 to 2021, it was only 21% closure. So we, we can see that we're, we're, we're picking up speed in that closure rate. Now, what does this mean? So let, let's pick up this first quote. When the last bank branch closes, people go away to do their shopping and banking and all that sort of stuff and a little town dies. Um, banking is an essential service. And so if you think about a regional community, there'll be a town in the center and there'll typically be smaller towns or farms or whatever in, in the surrounding area. And they all need to get, go somewhere to do their banking amongst other things like their shopping or getting their hair cut or going to the post office or whatever. So if the bank closes, they need to, that, that's a key thing that they need to do. They only want to make one trip. They don't want to go to that town for this thing and that town for another thing. So they'll find the next town. And then all of a sudden the, the activity, the commercial activity in the town falls away. And that's what, that's the little town dying that I'm talking about there. So this is a real issue. It, 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 it's actually an existential issue for some of these small towns, for these small communities in, in regional Australia. Okay, I'm gonna take a step uh, to the side for a minute. And I just wanna give you, I've, I've been talking about Australia and I'm conscious that I'm probably the only Australian in the room. So just tell you a little bit about Wait. the- Well, sorry, okay. <laughs> Gee, you've forgotten me already. <laughs> um, all right, Australia, 25 million population. We're the sixth largest country in the world. We're the second lowest population density in the world. Only Mongolia has less people per square kilometre than we do, uh, which does mean that these sorts of services, they are a natural challenge for us as a country, and we need to adapt to that. We are quite city-centric in a way, so a, you know, a, a large number of people in our big cities, but there's still 8 million people that live outside of those top eight cities. And there's three to four million people that live in what we would call outer regional and remote Australia. Yeah, so certainly enough people that we need to think about how we do services as well. From a banking perspective, uh, four major banks, uh, they make up 75% of the market. The rest of the market, there's about 80 operating banks, uh, combination of uh, international banks, um, smaller listed banks, and a very thriving mutual or, or, or uh, customer owned, member owned banking community. A lot of consolidation happening in the market at the moment, uh, as you might expect. Uh, ATMs, so there's no national network of ATMs. Uh, interchange was actually banned um, in 2009, I'm gonna say, somewhere around there. So that means that there's, the only way that you can do it is to provide services to your customer directly or to um, have your customers pay a fee. They're really the only 
that that's the baseline of the models that are there. And I think that's a bit different to the UK. Yeah, yeah. We, we have we have Link that helps us uh, uh, get the complete interchange uh, going here, which is which is um, different to what you have. Mm. Although uh, you're probably going to talk about it. You have um, the NPP, the New Payments Platform. We do. Which yes. which helps you with uh, you know real time deposit settlement. Right? Yes, that's right. Exactly. So 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 thinking about I guess the payment side of, of, of Australia. Um, uh, a couple of things to call out there. So FPOS, uh, we've had FPOS cash out since before I can remember. Um, uh, and, and so that, that's a really key piece in terms of people accessing cash. Uh, BPAY, a unified bill payment system since 97. Uh, and more recently, as, as Louis said, the, the new payments platform, uh, which uh, I guess certainly thinking about what Ron was talking about just now, talked a lot about open banking. Unfortunately, uh, for all of the, the good that he talked about with what we're doing with open banking and CDR, co sorry, the consumer data right in Australia, it's right only. Um, and so that means there's a whole different system, the new payments platform for real-time payments. Um, I'd like the, new, the open banking uh, platform to become right, uh, a read-write uh, system, but uh, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. But, but certainly uh, the NPP is an important piece of technology that we can leverage for, for some of the good work that we're doing. Okay, where am I going now? Um, okay, I want to step back into the, the flow of what we're talking about. And where I want to start is if we're going to get a solution to this problem that I'm talking about around declining cash and closures of branches, we need to understand some of the decisioning that happens within banks. And what I'm seeing is that it's important to understand three things. Uh, we need to understand the direction that banks are wanting to take. We need to understand their overarching strategy and we need to, need to understand how they are prioritising their decisions. And all of these things inform what we're delivering and how we're going to deliver it. And there's, there's, there's a few things that we're seeing are, that are important. So firstly, future of cash. Um, we see debate within most banks. That I've, I've not come across a bank yet that's got a landed position on what they think future of cash is going to be. They've got the people who are saying that cash is going to be 100% dead within 18 months. Um, They've been saying 18 months for at least five years now, so I'm, I'm not sure when it's going to start, but anyway. Uh, but then at the other end, there are people who are saying you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, uh, future of cash. Uh, the role of the branch is also an important one. And again, there's, there's massive debate within most banks I'm working with. Um, we should be a digital only bank. We've got to get rid of all of our branches through to we need to keep our branch network exactly the same as it is today and every other op uh, opinion in between. And certainly in Australia, the regulatory context is really important. So um, I've got a, a headline there, uh, CBA paid a 700 million AML penalty, Westpac paid a 1.3 billion AML penalty. Uh, we've also had a banking royal commission. There's been more than $7 billion in uh, customer um, uh, uh, remediation uh, paid. Uh, we've had of the, of the major four banks, uh, we've had uh, three CEOs and two chairs lose their jobs as a result of AML and the Royal Commission. So banks are acutely aware of the risk in the regulatory space. And that is a, a key conversation I have all the time with them in terms of anything I'm trying to do. So, similar here, Matt. I think um, there's, there's always a headline of, of somebody being chased for uh, regulatory uh, uh, issue and, and maybe a, a little bit of slip up. Mm -hmm. I think there's two other key points, though, that in your discussions you, 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 we've talked about and that re relate to us here in the UK. Uh, I got some data that says over, over 2 million people, uh, consumers in the UK are totally cash dependent. And then the other one is um, over 6 million people uh, uh, find it difficult or unable to move to digital. So mm. when we talk about you know, pre-stage of transactions and mm. digital e-wallets, and again, uh, at a conference a little while ago, I explained that my 93-year-old mother understands checks and physical cash, doesn't own a phone, is not on the internet, you know, we can't leave these people behind. Mm. Uh, so I'm sure that's gone into your discussions and maybe you want to share a bit on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll, we'll pick up on that a little bit as we go um, around who we're trying to provide these services to. Mm. And we need to think, if we're trying to solve for banks need to do something with their branch networks, we need, one of the things we'll talk about and I'll talk about in a little while is who's going to the branch and what are they doing? Um, and that, that's a really important okay. point because we need to meet them uh, at, their, at, at where they're at. All right. Um, okay, so if we understand some of the bank thinking and how they're making decisions and what they're making decisions around, one of the next things is to work through, okay, what commercial and operating model is going to work 
for, for, for banks. And so let's cast back 10, 15 years, and I'm sure this is pretty familiar to you, and it was probably a similar story to uh, the, 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 your local context. Uh, certainly in Australia, most banks were running Prime on everything in their service stack. So they would engage with multiple vendors for hardware, for software, for services, and, and for everything in between. And they would have a team of subject matter experts who would run that. There was a bit of uh, managed service going on, but, but that was probably the minority. What I'm finding now is that that has changed significantly. And there's probably three things that banks are, are calling out as a priority. Firstly, they don't want to own anything. They don't want to, want to own hardware. To be honest, they don't even want to own the cash that's in the device. They want to receive it as a consumer themselves. Um, secondly, they want variability from a commercial model perspective. And so what they're seeing is decline in cash, decline in transactions. They want to ride that uh, from a cost perspective. And so they would like us to take that risk on. Now, we need to work through whether we can make that sustainable, uh, but, but that's certainly a, a key call out that they want. Uh, and thirdly, they want flexibility. And so while we might be able to bring a solution to them today, if they want to transform their network tomorrow, we need to be able to adapt with them and, and have flexibility in our operating model to work with them. And so what we're seeing is on the, on the branch column there, there's a very strong shift down that uh, column towards as a service variable price models. Yeah. Offsite branded, um, frankly, that's dead in Australia now. So that was basically the ATM networks. If I go back three years, about 40% of the big four banks uh, ATMs were in offsite locations. That's now down to 7%, and I think it's probably going to get really close to zero within 12 months. So they have no interest in what used to be a really important channel for them. That has moved to the offsite multi-bank model. So certainly where, and I'll talk about what we've been doing in a second, uh, but, but there's now, um, between ourselves and a key competitor of ours, we run about 2,000 offsite multi-bank ATMs across the country. Um, and so we picked up probably at least 50% of what the banks have dis disposed of. Um, the ATM, the dispense ATM is obviously one part of it, but the broader banking solution is the other part. And so there's probably two things that I'll talk about here. Uh, Australia Post runs a bank of post model that's been running for quite a few years, was really supercharged in a sense uh, about five years ago. Um, all but one key bank are part of the bank of post model these days. And so certainly everybody's receiving services through it. It's got a lot of strengths and, and I certainly I commend them for all of the work that they're doing in terms of plugging a gap that's already in existence. Um, the challenge is, you know, they've got a lot of challenges in the way that they deliver that model, and particularly if banks are going to keep on closing branches, whether they can actually take that volume on, take those customers on, take that capacity on. Um, so there's some challenges there, and that's really one of the big reasons why we're building our precinct, because we think that there's problems with everything that's there at the moment, so let's see if we can throw something into the mix to, to get it right. Matt, do you see a monobank model? You haven't got that up there? So. There is a place for monobank, and I think that's an important one. If, if you asked me that question 12 months ago, I'd say, I think all banks should move to, to a multi-bank model. Right. Um, I've changed my thinking since then. Uh, and so some of the work that we're doing, for example, I'm working with one of the major banks in Australia at the moment, and we're actually running both a precinct pilot, or we're, sorry, we're, we're prepping to first quarter next year, set up a precinct pilot with them, and a proprietary branded pilot with them. So, so really running, but really a precinct inside type model for them. Um, and I think that there will be a monobank model um, for some banks. Right. Every bank is on a different journey. Uh, another one of the majors, they want multi-bank only. They don't, want, they don't want to have any transactional banking in their branches is where they, their end point that they're, they're aiming for. So it, it really depends on the bank and what their strategy is. Yeah. OK. All right, so I want to I want to now jump into what we're trying to do from, with precinct and, and where we're going. So this is a, a, a map of um, of our locations at the moment. Uh, what are these? <laughs> uh, these are dispense ATMs. So uh, we've been working on various iterations of precinct for probably seven or eight years now. Um, two years, uh, two, three years ago, uh, we acquired Westpac's offsite ATM fleet, so around 750 ATMs, um, and all of a sudden got instant coverage of the country, which is really exciting for us. Um, probably a, you know, a question you'd ask is why would, if we're trying to solve for bank branch uh, uh, rationalization, why do we buy an aging ATM fleet? Um, well, there's a few reasons for it. Uh, one is we, it, we wanted a seed fleet 
to put our presence out in the market, uh, to solve for access to cash, which as I talked about is a bit of a different story in, in Australia compared to the UK. Um, it was important for us from a credibility perspective. So again, think Precinct is owned by Prosegur. Prosegur is a cash and transit company. We're seen as trucks and guns in Australia. And so this was a really important shift in perception to say we're all about technology-led banking solutions. Um, and so, so that was a really important part for us. So we jumped into, into uh, ATM access and, and dispense ATMs. Now we're working through what next and where do we go from here? So I want to talk a little bit about who we're trying to service and what they need. And so this picks up on, on Louis' point just now uh, about, you know, for example, el elderly mother and how does, how does she receive services? So there's a bunch of segments, customer segments, and this, this is really looking at it from a bank's perspective. And so if banks are going to be able to transform and they're going to work with me as a partner to transform their network, I need to be able to service all of their customers. And if I, you know, talking about the options that I've talked about in the market just now, some ATM fleets, bank at post, that does consumer pretty well. It even touches into sole traders and maybe a little bit of small business pretty well. The forgotten segments are the large business and the institutional customers. Uh, there is no adequate solution for them at the moment. And when I talk to the banks, that's actually the most important one for them. That's where most of the value as a bank sits, their institutional bank. And even when you think about branches, it's business cash that's the biggest challenge for them. It's business cash they want to get out of the branches first. And so that's where we've got a lot of focus in terms of our initial build, is, is how do we solve a business? And then we'll move that into consumer as we go. What do we need to do? And so what, 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 what do these uh, customers need? Well, again, think about it from a bank branch rationalization perspective. If a bank's going to completely transform their branch network and remove services, we need to be able to do everything that they're trying to remove. And so that, of course, is anything from a transactional perspective. It goes beyond that as well. Uh, and certainly, we're not doing all of this at the moment. We're on a journey. Uh, but, but that's where we need to get to if banks are genuinely going to be able to transform and rationalize their networks. Now, of course, there's all sorts of relationships across this, and this is a real spaghetti bowl. And so I'm conscious that we can't just go on a, on a, on a bilateral basis and solve one at a time. Um, but if we try and solve all of it, we're going to completely blow ourselves up. Um, and so the approach that we're taking and, uh, is to, we need to chunk it down and say, okay, let's work on one part of the business customer base with a certain number of transactions. Let's get that right, prove that to the banks, give them confidence, move on to the next one. And, and that, that's really the approach that we're trying to take. And in doing that, one of the big focuses is customer experience. And this is you know, outside of probably talking about AML, this is the other big conversation that I have with banks all the time, is what is my customer going to experience? And this is not just what's the user interface on an app or how are you going to greet them when they come into a location? This is about the end-to-end -end journey that a customer takes through the experience, through a transaction, through the onboarding process, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it thinks about, as I've got on, on the screen, physical experience, the digital experience. It also thinks about value flows, you know, real-time payments. And why this is important is, as I'm trying to build this out, there's a bunch of boxes that are on our journey maps that we draw. Some things are really important. We have to get that right. If we don't get that right, the customer will walk away and they'll never try it again. Some things we can probably be a bit loose on. If we get it a bit wrong, it's probably okay and they'll, they'll be forgiving on it. So this helps us to understand how to make experiences that delight the customer where it matters the most. And there's really four, kind of, four categories that I would tip this customer experience thinking into. One is around the location and location considerations. One is around digital technology. One is around physical technology, and the last is around the unified experience. And, and, and we'll unpack a bit of this as, as, we, as we continue on. What I want to do, I want to, I want to try and capture this customer experience in, this is a promotional video I'm about to play, um, to, to give you a sense of, of how we're trying to project this to customers. And this is a focus on small business. So let me play it, and you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. <coughs> the grocer, Harriet the hairdresser, and Chef Charlie. They all live in a small town with no nearby access to a bank. But thanks to Precinct, they can now take care of all their banking needs, no matter who they bank with. 
Gabby can pick up her change for the week without having to travel far, while Harriet makes cash deposits that fit in with her appointment schedule. By setting up a precinct ID, Chef Charlie can get on with plating up while James deposits the day's earnings for him. All their cash is transferred in real time so they can get on with doing what they do best, running their business. Precinct, it's local, you can send someone else, avoid the queues and have access to funds immediately. Now you don't get that anywhere else. Give it a go. I like the technology is used, but I'm not allowed to mention that. Um, <laughs> Matt, Matt, let's talk about location. Um, um, because I was asked a couple of times and it's, a, it's quite a bit of a debate. So, so your white label transaction hubs, can, can we put them into a, a, you know, a Tesco store, a Sainsbury's store, or a Costa Coffee and co-locate, keep costs down and just transact? You can, to a point. Uh, so what, what I think, I guess if, you, if you're asking the question in terms of, let's, let's just put these services into every Sainsbury's, every Costa Coffee, that's not gonna work, would be my, in, in our experience, that's what we're seeing. Um, so let me, uh, jump into this. So let's talk a little bit about locations. We've done a lot of work on this from a research perspective, both looking at it from a national, where do we need to put it first, and looking at demographics and banking presence and so forth, but also at a, at a, at a branch selection, oh sorry, location selection perspective. We've got a bunch of criteria, and this is just to give you some examples. You know, we look at you know, where is their footfall? Um, what level of privacy is in the location for sensitive transactions versus fairly banal, uh, low, low value deposits and withdrawals? Um, do we need it to be close to branches or far from branches? Those sorts of questions. Um, and, and, and when you think about it, so, so using some examples, um, you know, let's say a fuel station, in, if, if I co-locate in a fuel station or, or in a Costa Coffee, what does that look like? Where's the profile versus say in a dedicated location? Um, as an example, I'll talk about one of our sites in a, in a moment. Um, you can see very different profiles. And what we need to be thinking about is which customers are we trying to service, what transactions are we trying to provide for them, and what do they need for that to be confident to receive it. Keeping in mind, and again, it was touched on in the last presentation briefly, um, customers have a high level of trust in their banks. Even when banks stuff up, they've got a high level of trust in their banks. And I'm not a bank, and so I need to make sure that I'm getting everything right on these types of measures for them to have confidence and trust in what I'm doing. And this tips into not just where do we put these locations, um, co-location versus dedicated and so on, but how do we configure these locations? And so these are two examples of locations that we have set up. Uh, the one on the left is what we call a courier hub. Uh, and so in Australia, a pretty big feature of the market is uh, using sealed bags, the customer using a sealed deposit bag, a, a soft skin courier, cash courier, coming and picking it up, taking it to a bank branch. This is set up to help them do what they do best. And so that means that they, they come through, they're coming in with 20, 30, 40, 50 bags. They want to be in and out as quickly as possible. So it's really, yeah, the, the, the device on the left is the main game in this location. Uh, and yeah, we've, we've actually worked with Consilian uh, to this device, uh, the, the, the factory version of it wasn't fast enough for what we, what we wanted. So we've reconfigured the device so it works even faster to enable that process to work really well. Uh, as compared to the, the, the location on the left, oh sorry, on the, on the right, um, is an access hub and that's really oriented kind of like in the video. It's a small business deployment where they're depositing uh, their high value notes, their takings, and they're getting changed to keep on running their store without needing to go to a bank branch. Yeah? So, so different types of deployment, different configurations for different, uh, different use cases. So we talked about location. I want to touch briefly on digital technology. And again, this comes back to the which customers are we servicing. So we have an app platform that we've spent years building out, to be honest, and, and, and reworking to, to, to work in the precinct model. Uh, this is used for onboarding, for terms and conditions acceptance, for user management, for pre-staging transactions, reconciliation, notifications, a bunch of different things. And that's all well and good. And for business customers, that's going to be, generally speaking, ideal. But there's a bunch of users who either they don't want another app on their phone or they can't use an app on their phone. And so how do we service them effectively? And so at the moment, the app is kind of the main game for us, but we're working feverishly on other options. I've got a PCI card there because everyone is familiar with their debit card. 
They know how to use it, and so let's, let's work with that as a piece of technology. Um, we're also working on things like biometric recognition, so that people can use a, use, use a, uh, sorry, perform a transaction with no card, no device, no anything, just with their face or their, their fingerprint or whatever else. So we talked about digital. Let's talk about the, the physical technology that we need. Take your time here, Matt. This is the good stuff. <laughs> so there are a few consilient devices up on the screen here. Um, this, and again, this, this comes back to what are we trying to deliver in a location? So you'll see yeah, that we've got, we've got the ATM on the screen in the bottom right there. Um, what do we need the ATM for? We need it to accept notes and, we, and dispense notes. Uh, loose notes is, is primarily, ideally recycled as well. Um, and that works really well for consumers, uh, and that's an important piece of technology. Um, but we need to be able to do coin deposits, coin withdrawals, roll coin dispensing. We need to do bag deposits, and I can keep on going with other, other types of transactions. And again, it's about having the right technology configuration for the right services for the right customers. Yeah. So, so Matt, before you, you stop there, I, uh, one thing that impressed me when I was working with Matt was, was part of the challenge we've got to deploying this stuff is because we're a heavily regulated industry, there's lots of uh, legacy technology that causes barriers to us, you know, trying to deploy technology in a new way. Um, and what, what was intriguing for me was uh, a number of workshops went on with the, with the precinct team to find out how they could deploy devices leveraging our new payments platform, but do it in a self-service mode. So, so one example was uh, that they do a... Um, a debit card transaction to the switch, which validates PIN to check that it's Louis using the device. Then it does a secondary transaction, which is the deposit, using the name payments platform to credit my account, or the account I choose to pay, right? So, so instead of going with tradition, you know, lining up to develop through, you know, the traditional uh, uh, systems and legacy items, they, they were able to, you know, jump the queue and get the transactions they needed in the locations they needed, by adopting a new approach to the architecture. It would, and we'd be delighted to have more discussion with you about some of those things. Because if anybody here, either a bank uh, or a service provider to financial institutions, this will be a problem uh, in the UK market. How do we do these transactions effectively, quickly, and in a timely manner? And then how do we deploy them quickly uh, and we went through a lot of pain to work out how to do it, right? We did, yeah. And, and, and look, that's, it's an important point because really, yeah, when you're talking about national payments technology and payments architectures, they all move at, from, if you're trying to develop things fast, they are moving at treacle pace. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think yeah, debit card deposits through the FPOS scheme in Australia, I think that's probably still another 12 to 24 months away and will depend on issuing banks to rework the messaging on their switch to accept those, those, those transactions. Um, and so that, that, was a, that, that was a really important shift in the way that we're doing things. If we want a debit card uh, deposit, we've got to find another way to do it. And so working through how we do that. And you know, we do think we use the NPP a lot. We do direct bank integrations as well. And, and there's, there's a bit of a mix and match depending on our partner bank. But I think uh, you know, let, let's, um, let's leapfrog off that to, to, I guess, the point on, on the conclusion. So this is a cartoon which, if, if any of you have seen Agile stuff around on the internet, you'll be familiar with this cartoon. And it kind of shows the idea of Agile methodology where if you want a car, then you don't build the wheels and then build the, the base and then build the, the frame and get a, get a, a you know, the, the gearbox in and, and, and so on. Um, if we were doing that, yeah, so, so to, to pick up on the example we just had before, we would be waiting for our gearbox still if we were trying to do deposits using a debit card. Um, so we need to do it, to do it a different way. Um, and so um, you know, the, the agile approach is build a skateboard first. And then when, you, when, when, when you've got a skateboard working, what do you need next? Well, I need to steer, so I build a scooter. Oh, I've got a scooter, that's great. I don't want to use my leg to push on the ground anymore. Let's, get, let's build a bike, because then I can pedal. Oh, I don't want to pedal anymore. Let's build a motor. We've got a motorbike, and then eventually you get to a car. Yeah? Now, what does this mean on, on what I've been talking about just now? Well, I'm thinking there's probably two sides to the audience in the room. There are those who are trying to build solutions around this, and there are those who are going to be customers of these solutions, uh, banks and others. If you're trying to build these solutions, my question to you is, what is your skateboard? Yeah? Find a skateboard, prove a basic product, to then prove the next product and the next product, and work 
to test it in the market, test it with banks, test it independently. So we've got both a, an independent track that we're building out and a bank partner track that we're building out. And that's really important in, in order to, uh, yeah, it frees us to go and try things out. Yeah? So, so what is your skateboard? Work that out and keep on going. If you're a bank, if you're receiving these services, then be realistic. Don't go into the market asking for a BMW because it's unlikely that anybody in the market has a BMW today. What you need to do, if you want to support solution providers to get you to a BMW, work with them, yeah? partner with them, give them confidence that you're, you're going to work with them for the long term, let them, uh, give them access to your customers. You know, for, for me, the user is three steps away. So if I can get access to the bank's customer to ask them questions, to pilot things with them, that sort of thing, that's, that's gold. Yeah? So, so work with them and give them access to your resources, your knowledge, your capability, and, and, and be willing to fail. Let things fail. So yeah, we've had times where we've been at a scooter and all of a sudden we've made a surfboard and worked out the surfboard's not going to work if we want to get to a car. So we've needed to fail on that come back and, and work out what the bicycle is. Yeah? So, so be willing to fail and, and I know that that's, that's a really hard thing for banks to hear. <laughs> um, the banks that I work with don't like fail, they don't like risk, uh, and so that's a big step for them. But the more you can do that, the faster you're going to get to your BMW. Yeah? Um, look, I hope these sessions have been helpful. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the, for the rest of the day and tomorrow I'll be on the Kinsaline stand. So more than happy to um, have questions afterwards or any questions you might have now. Thanks very much.